lecture, which is Dr. Yelita Sunich, Sunich yes, who will present us uh, about uh, how should be changed uh, campaigns, the Kaiser campaign with social media in different cultural settings. Uh, Dr. Sunich, uh, quite a professional, in a professional sphere, she uh, actually working quite a lot in communication sphere. She began her career as a journalist in Slovenia and spent 25 years uh, at the UN High Commissioner for the Refugees in senior positions and uh, we're quite happy to uh, that she will be share her experience uh, of her work, working in many different countries uh, and, uh, will, uh, and, and will keep all our attentions to, to your presentations. And uh, then after the, after the presentation, we'll have a session with uh, questions and answers. Uh, and we'll, I think that uh, Dr. Milita Sunic uh, can start immediately right after that speech. Thank you for this invitation and this chance to speak to you. My only regret is that I came at the wrong time. The students are already gone. So it's going to be academia I'm talking to. And I brought with, with me um, a whole class of students. We are holding a workshop on basic communication techniques for UNHCR and their partners for the Central European region. So they also came with me today. Um, I am um, today talking about the, what I call the, the royal discipline of campaigning, which is attitude changing. So not normal marketing, but campaigning that changes attitudes of a whole society. And to make it more complicated, I'm talking about such campaigns in different cultural environments. So. Are there any smokers here? You don't have to be ashamed, I'm also smoking. <laughs> so, okay. So why aren't you smoking? It's, you know, when you listen to a lecture, sometimes it's nice to... Why are you not smoking? Why are the smokers not smoking here? When I am very old, so I also visited the Soviet Union. When I visited the Soviet Union, everybody was smoking. At conferences, at meetings, press conferences. Everybody was smoking. Why not? Why don't you smoke? Council for Health. Sorry? Council for Health. Yeah. But they smoke. They just don't smoke here, the smokers. So it's as unhealthy in the corridors as it's here. Why don't they smoke? It's not culturally accepted anymore. It's not culturally accepted anymore. They respect others. They respect others. Others, okay. Yeah. So, the, is it because of the message of the box? You already gave the answer. So a message alone does not change an attitude. Just because you see this message does not make you change your mind. So no single poster, no single TV spot has ever changed the attitude towards something. Why is it? It's because of the people around. So if you want to reach attitude change, if you want people to behave differently than they behaved before, then you have to change not the one person, but you have to change the society. You have to bring the society to, dis to discuss issues. So as long as it was acceptable to smoke, people smoke. When does it come? When do you know it's not acceptable? When someone comes and says, what are you doing? Why are you smoking? When it becomes a topic in the society. When do you know it's not acceptable to drink and drive? When you're at a party and you have a few drinks and then you're looking for your key and someone says, uh-uh, you're not going to drive home, I'm calling you a taxi. And this is when you know that the attitude has changed. As long as everybody says, oh, oh, oh I can do drive, and he goes and drives after I don't know how many vodkas, the attitude hasn't been changed. And it's not because he himself, the person who drinks, will change his or her mind. It's because 
the society will start discussing this issue. And this is a very important point. In marketing, what's the difference? Your normal campaign is the marketing campaign. In marketing campaigns, you try to reach, I don't know, you want to sell shampoos or anything else, cars, um, pills, whatever. And for instance, your goal is selling 100,000 bottles of shampoo in a big city, like maybe not in, in, in Bishkek, but in real Moscow. You want to, uh, uh, you have a new shampoo, and your goal is to, to sell 100,000 bottles of this shampoo in this month. What do you need to do? You need to reach each, each uh, person who wants to buy, uh, who are looking for a shampoo, and whom you can convince that maybe this time you try my shampoo and not the other, the competition's shampoo. So you need to reach individuals, and it's enough if they go and buy it once, then you've reached your goal. If I want attitude change, if I want a whole society to change in the way they behave, in, the, in their values, what they believe is right and what they believe is wrong. That's obviously much more complicated than selling shampoo. And it's not enough to know that you know something is wrong and you know something is wrong and you know something is wrong. It's important that as a society we start discussing these issues. Then you will reach change. Not if you reach separate people. Again, shampoo buyers, they don't have to talk to each other. It's not necessary that shampoo buyer A tells shampoo buyer B that he likes the product. It doesn't change your marketing goal. But when you want to change attitudes, you have to reach the society as a whole. I, there are so many, and, and you know them, how long it takes to change attitudes. Don't drink and drive breast cancer awareness, I found something against domestic violence. It's, again, it's, it changes what we believe, what we think is right, what we think is wrong, and it changes it on a collective uh, level. So this is already a very complicated goal. Now if you do it across a culture, and this is what very often happens. A new, uh, an advertising agency from country A is asked to work in country B. So you do it across culture, and uh, that's a double challenge. Because not only do you have to do the attitude change, which is complicated enough, you have to do it in a society which you don't necessarily know how it works. And these are the kinds of campaigns I'm specializing in, in the field of migration. So, I'll show you a few examples of campaigns that went wrong. This, for instance, is a campaign of the German government to keep Afghan, potential Afghan refugees out, to tell them, please don't come to Germany, Germany is not as good as you think, it's going to be more difficult than you expect. Okay? So, what did they do? They did this nice post, they asked an agency, a German agency, I assume, to do posters. So they did a poster. This poster is even by Western standards, it's not an interesting poster. I mean, it's as boring as hell. It's just black on white. It's, it's um, I, I'm even told by people uh, who speak Dari, I think it's Dari, that it's written wrong, that there are some orthographic uh, uh, mistakes, but fine, uh, we don't know that. But it's not only is it boring, it is, where do they show it? They show it in the cities, so mostly in Kabul and Herat, some of the major cities. They showed it in the cities, and you see they have this QR code, so they're showing it to people who have smartphones, so that they will then be so struck by this, and so interested in this, that they will use the QR code to go to a certain website. I don't know how many people really went, but in any case, if we know who is coming, the refugees, the asylum seekers who are coming to Europe, are from backwards, provincial areas. Many of them illiterate, many of them 
don't have electricity, let alone a, a mobile phone and let alone a smartphone. And if they have a smartphone, it doesn't help them because they're illiterate, remember. So anything that they can read on the website, even if they would know what a QR is, even if they opened it, they couldn't read it. So it's wrong on so many levels that I would say just take the money and distribute it to the poor people in Afghanistan and don't make these campaigns. They don't help. It's useless to do such campaigns. Why? Because they did not understand how the society works. I'll show you another example. By the way, I showed these examples at the European when I was still with UNHCR, I'm retired now and I run my own agency. But I showed those examples also in the European conference and then the embassies of these countries, of Germany and of, of Denmark, started calling me and complaining that I had, I had openly criticized them. Okay, so I hope no one is informing the ambassadors of Germany and Denmark. So, another campaign was same idea by the Danish government in this case. Um, during the Syrian crisis, they wanted to tell Syrians, please don't come to Denmark, we don't want you. Okay. So they asked an advertising agency, and the advertising agency did something with the logic of Denmark. They said, okay, these people are speaking the same language, uh, they wanted to reach people in Jordan, refugees who were already in Jordan, and they told them, Syrians, stay in Jordan, don't come to Denmark. That was the message. So they asked the advertising gurus in Denmark, and they said, fine, they speak the same language, they share a language which is Arabic, so what we can do is we can use Arabic language advertisements to, to, to disseminate the message. And that's what they did. That's an ad of the Danish government in a Jordanian newspaper. But again, Jordan is not Denmark. In the Arab societies, in the Arab societies, only a small elite is reading newspapers. Newspaper is an absolute minority program for intellectual elites. Number one. So you are using a very small, you are reaching a very small segment of your target audience. Secondly, if you are a refugee in Jordan, you have very little money, you're not going to waste it on newspapers. So you're not going to read the newspaper. And also, uh, what is important, and, and if you are interested in news, and if you're intellectual, and you're a Syrian refugee in Jordan, you're going to open the Al Jazeera portal to see what's happening in your country. You are not reading Jordanian newspapers. And even if by chance a Syrian refugee saw this and he wants to go for some reason because he had a, has a brother there, he wants to go to Denmark, do you think that this will make him change his mind? It's not really breathtaking, is it? So what I'm trying to say is campaigns, attitude changing campaigns and campaigns across cultural borders need to be very well researched and planned. So, what are the caveats? First of all, standard marketing techniques do not automatically apply. In a different country, I just had a discussion with one of the teachers here who said, even my students, whether they come from Tajikistan or Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, they have different attitudes, different approaches, to, to things, they have a different culture. So what, what works in one country might not work in another. In some countries you are very straightforward, in some countries you don't criticize openly. Humor is used differently, uh, gender roles are different, so you cannot just what you learned in one country and say this works well, then you take it and use it in another country. Though social media are no, now sort of unifying things to some degree, but still it's different from country to country. There's no one size fits all, evidently. What works in one society might not work in another one. 
what to do, you have to do a thorough research of your target audience. You have to understand where you are and how a society functions. Then you will be able to do a campaign. And also, it's not about money. Sometimes people say, yeah, but we don't have much money, so we, don't, uh, we cannot make a good campaign. Believe me, it's not about money. You can use a lot of money and do a wrong campaign. And with small uh, budgets, you can do fantastic social media campaigns. Now, I'm not going to dwell a lot into, into theory, but just a tiny bit because after all it is an academic setup. Everyone who deals with marketing will be, uh, will be aware of the AIDA uh, concept or the AIDA model which says if you want to market your shampoo or whatever it is you want to market, first you need to get the attention of your audience, then you need to, to arouse their interest, then you need to create a desire for that shampoo. And then you need to achieve action. So you have to make people go to the supermarket and actually buy it. So that's very briefly this the, the, the AIDA model that is being used in, in uh, uh, marketing campaigns. So I modified that a bit for attitude changing campaigns. These are the various phases of a campaign. First of all, attention. The messages, if the messages never reach the target audience, nothing will happen. So the famous newspaper in Jordan, which where the message never reached the target audience, you cannot influence anyone if they never see it. Or I have a very nice story of a European government, they wanted to understand the discourse of, of uh, potential Syrian and Iraqi refugees with uh, their dialogue with smugglers. So they had a project of researching Twitter and they researched and researched and they refined their research strategies for one year and never found anything. And Guy told me that and then I said because they do not use Twitter. That was three, four years ago. I don't know if this is still the case because these things change. But at that time, Arabs didn't use Twitter. So you can research as much as you want. You spend lots of money. You should have gone to one Arab Syrian refugee in the street and said, does your society use Twitter? And they would say, Twitter, Twitter, no. And then you would have known. So please research your target audience to choose the right channels. This is the cognitive stage. So if they never, it never comes to their attention, if they never know of a campaign, you will not achieve anything. The second stage then is that not only do they have to see the message, it has to be interesting for them, which already changes into an effective stage. We, especially in humanitarian work, we often think that we will move people with facts and statistics and data. People are not moved by facts, people are moved by feelings. So, you have to find messages that resonate with the individual. Um, they have to meet the cultural values, the information needs, and the source of information has to be credible. What does that mean? If Imagine a doctor who is smoking tells you, you shouldn't smoke, this is not really good for your health. Or a doctor who is obese tells you, you are overweight, you should you lose at least five kilos. You say, he is telling me what to do? The source of information is not credible. So if the source, sorry, if the source is not credible, you will not believe the whole message. Also, cultural values. Let's go back to our don't drink and drive campaign. If you want to reach men who, who drink and drive in a certain age where they have families, then maybe you should not talk about them. You should talk about children, what it is for children to grow up without a father. This is something that will move them. 
If they think yeah, it's very good to be man and to drink and drive, I can drink as much as I want and I can drive, you will not reach them. But then you say, and what will your what will your children feel if they lose you? What memory will stay behind after you? That could move them. You see, you have to touch them. You have to find something that resonates with their values. In a rural, religious environment, you might, you might resort to religious, to ethical um, arguments. In a more urban, intellectual environment, you can, you, you can use other things like pride, pride and social status. But you have to use arguments that affect the target audience. Then, and in that case, it's not desi desire as in the classical um, AIDA model, it's discourse. You have to reach a critical number of people who start discussing. Like a critical number of people saying, no, we should stop smoking in meetings. Or, no, it's not good uh, um, to, to it, it's not normal to beat up your wife. We don't accept domestic violence. If this becomes an issue and people discuss about it, you can change it. If nobody, everybody thinks it's normal and nobody talks about it, you will not change it. So it's very important to have a message in a growing number, among a growing number of people, to have this discourse. Then, all of a sudden, you discuss about an issue differently. You shift from the affective to the behavior stage. So not only do you say, maybe it's not so good to drink and drive, you will also Change your attitude, and when you drink, you will not drive, you'll call a taxi, or you will ask someone else who, who has not been drinking to drive you home. And this is how attitude change is reached. If the public discourse reaches a critical mass, if enough people start discussing an issue in society, you will have a paradigm shift. All of a sudden, things that were acceptable before, will not be acceptable any longer. And, and society will have changed. And uh, attitude change in campaigns must be crafted in a way that they follow these phases. Looks very complicated, and I can tell you it is complicated, but it can be done with the right research in the beginning. I will show you one campaign that I designed when I was still in UNHCR. And I'm quite proud of this campaign because it was setting new standards campaigning. You see, it's all to do with refugees and migration, but this is the topic where I come from. It was about, um, or it still is about Somalis and Eritreans, people from the Horn of Africa, who were trying to get to Europe. And many of them, now it has changed with the Syrian migration and so on, but at, at the time when I designed the campaign, they were the ones who, who were most probably the victims of drowning, who most probably died on the way trying to reach Europe. So it was about uh, uh, reaching them, and it doesn't make sense to reach them some European governments tried to reach them when they were already in Libya at the coast. It doesn't make sense because by that time they already invested time and money and they have gone through very difficult situations. It's like telling a marathon runner who already sees the goal, maybe you should stop here. It doesn't work like that. So we were the first ones who started such a campaign in the country of origin or in the refugee camp from where they started their journey before they met the smuggler. Because what is happening, the smugglers are going around in the camps and are saying to the young people, why don't you come to Europe? I'm sure your mother has some gold, you can give me your mother's gold and then I'll take you to Europe and it's not a long journey and it's very easy and they tell them all sorts of things and the young people who don't have a happy life in a refugee camp or in a dictatorship like Eritrea, they believe it and then they follow them. So it's important to reach them before they have been influenced by the smuggler. And that was something that had not been done before. And, oh, and 
it's important to counter the narrative of the smugglers and tell them really how dangerous it is, A, and B, a lot of people think once they're in Europe, it's going to be milk and honey. Then the situation is resolved. They don't know that they will have go, to go through an asylum procedure. They might be rejected. They might be sent back. They just don't know because the smuggler doesn't tell them. So, why is this campaign different? Because what we did is we said, if now the European Union or a European government starts telling them, listen, it's very dangerous, it's like the smoking doctor who tells you not to smoke. They will understand that there's a hidden agenda behind it. What needs, but if we really want to save lives, we need to have a credible source of information. So what we did is we asked people who have gone through all of that to tell their stories. It's not scripted, it's just a camera sitting there and the people are telling their stories. It's not edited, it's like people telling to people. Why? These are oral societies, as most societies are. At what I've seen for Central Asia, these are also still oral societies with an oral tradition. What does that mean? They rather believe, they rather ask another person whom they think, okay, your experience, can I ask you about this and that because you know about this? Then going to an official website, then looking for official information. Because also for some political history of the region, political sources, official sources are maybe not so trusted. So what we said is they trust each other. So let them tell to each other the truth. And that's what we did. We found people in Europe who were telling the real story. And we did not impose messages or slogans. It's like what I said about the text on the, on the, on the cigarette package. It's not a slogan that moves you. It's the emotions of this person who is breaking down in tears, telling how he was enslaved, how he has been tortured, what happened to him, how his family had to pay ransom, and, and, and. All these stories will help you move. It, and the most important thing, it reenacts traditional communication patterns. So if you want, if you're working in NGOs here, if you're working in, in, in projects for your societies here, find out what are the values, what moves them, who is a real good source of information, and use those. Don't come with your knowledge from a different country or a different continent and try to use it here. Reenact the traditional communication patterns of your target audience. So, what did we do? Phase one, we made this test, which is attention. We made this testimony. So now you have these videos. That's not enough to have the videos. So what did we do? We disseminated them through Facebook because Facebook is very popular in the target audience. And also through radio and web portals and TV stations. And we had, and also for those areas where they don't have, because we're talking of Africa for these areas where they don't have electricity, where they don't have Facebook and so on, we had meetings where we showed and screened those video testimonials. So first of all, attention that people really know about this. That's the first phase. Second phase, interest. Does it interest them? And how do we know that it interests them? We knew because Facebook interest was growing every month. We knew because all of a sudden teachers and refugee leaders started coming to the team and said, can you organize an event with us? Can you tell us more about this? So we knew at that stage that we had reached phase number two. And we also used, and this is a very important tool that works in most societies, we also used celebrities. In Africa, musicians and actors work very well, at least in this part of Africa. Africa is a huge continent. In other parts, religious leaders might work. In other parts, footballers are very pro can be very prominent and influence society. So you look for people who can be ambassadors, messengers of, and who can reach the people more than you can do as, as a government, as an NGO, as a UN organization. 
And what we also say, saw that the diaspora in Europe already uh, all of a sudden started to get involved and interested in campaigns. So we knew we had reached phase number two. Now phase number three, this course within the target audience. And you see here an event where they were composing songs about migration to Europe by themselves and started discussing, started staging when events, the people themselves. We also saw on Facebook, it's not only enough that it was on Facebook, but that it was shared and that it was commented on. This is what we want to achieve. We want the people to discuss amongst each other about the issues. And what we managed is to break a social taboo. Before we had started this campaign, what happened is that those who had reached Europe, they were under such a pressure to say, yes, it's well, it's good. Even if it wasn't, even if they were living in refugee camps. I once interviewed a refugee in Rome, in really a horrible place, smelly, horrible, the canalization was overflowing. They were sharing, 10 people were sharing a room. And he told me, if I take pictures of this and send it home, people will think I'm a loser. So I stand in front of nice cars and nice houses, and these are the pictures that I sent home. So the people at home always think it's much better than it really is. And we managed to break the taboo, and all of a sudden these people were giving testimonials and telling the real story, telling like it really was. And also, what we saw is that refugees starting to compose songs, they had um, poetry slams, children were performing issues, so they really get involved. So the, the community themselves, it's not us telling them what to do, it's the community themselves. Uh, that that wanted to change something, phase three, and now phase four. Do we see attitude change? I took this picture because you maybe you don't understand it, but it's significant. This is a guy who is selling water, drinking water, potable water. It's not so in the, in the refugee camps. And what he put on his little cart. Is, a, is one of the posters used from the campaign. By the way, the posters were all designed by local, um, by, by local artists. So even he thinks it's important enough for me to put it on my card. He has nothing to do with it, but it's, 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 he sees it's an important message. This is why I took this picture. We, see, we saw that more and more people were giving testimonies. We saw that all of a sudden the youth did not talk only about leaving, they started to talk about staying, they asked about, they went to the camp uh, management and said, we want education, we want a football field. So they wanted change in their lives, which showed us, before they were only interested about leaving. So we saw the paradigm shift that started, and yeah, and they were asking for, for, for and, and also youths were competing with each other, because before that, you could just see the youth leave. Each month, we had fewer in our refugee registration, we had fewer young people. And all of a sudden, this was reversed. But the, the, the bad thing about this is that it doesn't, you don't change it once and then it's over. You have to keep it up. And this is something, there is no short-term solution for attitude change. So. This was all a bit theoretical and a bit far from your field, but now a very practical advice. If you want to do campaigns in your or in a different cultural environment, there are seven questions you need to ask yourself. You need to find the answers, and if you find the answers, they will help you to, they will guide you to the right campaigning tools. Number one is who exactly is my target audience? What does that mean? So if I want domestic violence to stop, for instance, then my target audience might be the women. So that I tell them, women, you don't have to be ashamed. It's not your fault. It's the man's fault who is beating you up. If I want to, but maybe I want to reach the men. And I'll tell them, listen, you don't prove yourself as a real man if you beat up a woman. 
if you want to measure yourself in your manlyhood and measure up against other men, but leave the women alone. So depending who you think, who might change the attitude, you will look at that. If your target audience, if, if you're, for instance, when I looked at <clears throat> migration campaigns, we saw that in Afghanistan, it's not the young man who decides that he's going to leave for Europe, it's the father or the grandfather, the patriarch, who says, you are going to Europe. And then he says, okay, okay, and he leaves. In, er, among Eritreans and Somalis, it's the other way around, that the young people decide amongst themselves and they don't even tell their parents. One night, they disappear. So in Afghanistan, my target audience is the father, not the son. In the, uh, in the Horn of Africa, my target audience is the young people. Then what language do they speak? Especially in international setups, I very often see that for some reason, because it's done by people who most, most of them speak English, or maybe in your setup it will be Russian, we assume that everybody else speaks it as well. No, look at it. Who is my target audience and which language do they speak? Do they speak local languages only? Then you have to reach them through those languages. Is Russian for them a second language, a poor language? Then don't use it. Are they literate? To which extent? In which script? Once you find that out, it's obvious that someone who can read and write, you can use written information. If they cannot read and write, or hardly can read and write, you will have to resort to pictures, to other forms of information. But look at it before. Don't assume. Also, very important, what information channels do they habitually use? Is, it, is the youth using social networks? Then it works. But if you want to use older people, if you want to reach poorer areas, then social networks might not be the right thing. Maybe then the good old radio is much better. Don't assume, find it out. Also, which information sources do they trust? Especially if you come from big institutions, you believe in big institutions. And you think, okay, if the government says something, if the UN says something, if we as a big international NGO say something, then people will believe us. No, we are serious actors, serious players. But don't assume that. It's not true. In many societies, there is a certain skepticism against official information. So go back and see who do they trust? And then is it each other? Is it your teacher? Is it, is it the local leader? Is it, again, a celebrity, a musician, a revered actor? Look at it, see who is the source of message, uh, or source of information they trust. Is it one newspaper or one TV program that's more popular than another one? Then take those. Then, who influences the decisions, positively or negatively? Like in my migration campaigns, I have to look what the smugglers are saying to understand who influences them. If I have a campaign, I don't know, against, let's do again, drinking, drinking and driving, then I have to see what makes people drink, because it's expected, because it's the normal behavior, because if you don't drink as a man, you are seen as a, you know, sissy, you are not really a real man if you don't drink, things like that. So you have to see what makes them behave in a way that you want, to, uh, that, that you don't like and that you are trying to change. And also, what can prompt intra-community discourse? Because this is your ultimate goal. You have to get the society to discuss with each other. It's not your slogan, it's not your article, it's nothing you give them as a campaigner. It's what the people start discussing amongst themselves. And if you really went through it and did your homework, 
and found all the answers to these questions, then I can guarantee you, you will find the right campaign, the right tools, the right ways to set up your campaign, and you will be one step closer to reaching attitude change. That's it. Thank you, and I'm very interested to hear your questions. Thanks a lot. I'm joining to the process of our audience. And by the way, do you know how many, what the percentage of Kyrgyz women, or not Kyrgyz women in Kyrgyzstan, think that husband has the right to beat her wife? It's, yes, it's 34%. 34% of women in Kyrgyzstan think that husband has the right to do violence against a girl wife. It's extremely high in the south, in the rural areas. It's not a joke, unfortunately. So, uh, but you know, may I just say something? Um, I'll tell you, I come from originally from the former Yugoslavia, and I'll tell you a joke that was really funny still 20 years ago, but things change. What is now may have maybe different in 10 years. So in Montenegro, which is one part, one very remote part, in my high mountains, remote villages, uh, one neighbor comes to another, a neighbor lady comes to the other one, because you visit each other and have coffee. So she comes to have coffee with her neighbor and she cries and she cries. And then uh, the, this woman asks her, but why are you crying, my dear? What's happening? And she says, my husband doesn't love me anymore. And she says, but why? How do you know? And she says, he has beaten me for a month. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, it's a Russian uh, proverb, unfortunately Russian. Yes, if somebody beats you, he loves you. It's not true. Uh, but uh, you are right. Uh, it's, if you're looking on the age of women who are answering this, it's mostly elder, elder generation. <laughs> Young girls don't think that their husband has tried to do it. But maybe uh, you have some questions? Somebody.